Hey everyone, here we are in my craft room at home so we can crochet together like it's crochet night at the library. I'm here with one of my yarn walls because I have three and maybe a problem, but that's okay. And I thought it would be fun to do this here so you can see the whole entire project from start to finish. So I'll be filming uh, starting now and I won't leave until I have a scrubby to show for it. Um, another perk of working from home is that you get to meet my bunnies. Norman! This is Norman. We named him Norman so that when we see him we can go, Norm! And he's a 50-50 French, English, Angora rabbit. So, he's pretty big. He tolerates the pets because he's sleepy right now. Tribble! He's Norman's brother. And he's eating hay while laying down because that's the way he rolls. And he looks a lot different, but he is a 50-50 French English Angora. Tribble! Tribble doesn't like to be pet. But we force it on him. Yes, enjoy the pets, Tribble. Yeah. Aren't they cute? <laughs> they're also uh, Angoras, so they're a wool uh, you can use to make yarn. So someday I should try that because I have a lot of their fur that I just don't have anything to do with. Um, okay, so today's project, as you heard, is going to be a spiral scrubby. And uh, we've talked about in the intro video that this is not a spiral. I'm aware of that. And this is what the traditional pattern looks like and makes. Um, and if you use a self-striping cotton yarn, cotton really is the best uh, when you're making uh, anything that you want to absorb water with. Um, it will make the spiral pattern because of this, the stripes in the yarn and then you cinch it up and it makes this shape. Uh, with one color, you don't really see the spiral effect, but you do get a nice round scrubby that makes um, scrubbing pots and pans really nice or maybe a nice exfoliating bath. And it's a nice double layered thing. So I kind of adapted this pattern to just use this yarn because I wanted to, um, although this is the intended result. So. You, while you're out someday, you want to make another one, grab some self-striping cotton yarn and do the same exact thing that we're about to do. And you'll just have a almost like a brand new project. So you'll notice a bit of a size difference here. Um, the green one is much larger than the spiral one. And that's because of the yarn bulk. Uh, the green yarn has all those extra frills on it. So it is a lot bulkier and creates a bigger project. And the cotton yarn is much thinner in comparison and makes a smaller project. This uh, does affect your project if you choose uh, different yarns than what your pattern calls for. You can expect a different result, um, so do be aware of that. I will point out the point in the project where this is most important, and I'll, I hope I will tell you <laughs> where um, to watch for that. You could add a row or subtract a row depending on uh, how big your project gets at a certain point. Don't freak out over the crazy yarn. I, I know <laughs> it's gonna be hard to see your stitches and I am going to crochet with a, a line of white thread so that you can see the difference. This will affect my gauge. So um, I will have to be careful with how that works out and that'll be a good opportunity for me to show you what you need to look for. I, I, I get that these kinds of yarns are intimidating and I hope this gives you some confidence to go and buy some other fun yarns and and if nothing else you'll be really good at identifying all of your stitches after this because you'll need to look at them and they will be rather difficult to count so you might want a stitch marker on hand that can be a safety pin or a little extra thread just just something to mark your place um, I will show you that this is how much yarn I had left over when I was done so I might very well get a whole second scrubby out of this much leftover yarn. Um, so if you feel like that's what you want to do with it, go for it. You could make a square, you know, just a simple back and forth, a couple rows um, for a washcloth. And then you can use the same yarn in a slightly less complicated pattern. Um, and you'll get the same kind of scrubby benefits. It just won't be, I guess you could fold it over and sew it up and get your double layer if you'd like to do that. But at that point, you've basically almost made the scrubby. So you might as well just <laughs> make the scrubby. It looks like I didn't even use any, but 
I made a whole scrubby out of it. I mentioned in the beginning that you will want to have some basic knowledge of crochet before we start, and that knowledge includes single crochet, chains, slip knots, increasing and decreasing uh, with single crochet. So if you don't have those skills, I won't be extensively teaching them in this video. So you might wanna hunt around on YouTube for another tutorial to teach you those things if you don't already have them in your crochet skill bag. This pattern's available for free online. That's where I got it, and I will link uh, in the description where you can find it if you'd like to see the original. This one has slightly been altered uh, to suit my purposes here with you today. Uh, you wanna leave a really long tail for sewing. I, I usually go like, whoop, way too much, but better safe than sorry, right? So to make a slip knot, I basically just hold on to my tail, and this is the working yarn, the bit that's attached to my yarn ball, and I send it around my fingers and cross, and then I can take the working yarn and push it down underneath my yarn that's draped over my fingers. There it goes. And then I can pull on that yarn while I hold my tail, and it makes a loop. Then I usually throw my yarn needle in there, or crochet hook, and cinch it right up. There you go. You may notice that uh, the yarn doesn't slide as easily as would something that didn't have this much texture to it. And that's just something to be aware of, uh, especially when we get to the part where we're working in our ends. Uh, you wanna be a little bit more careful about where you send your needle because you're gonna have to drag a really bulky string through and you wanna make that as painless as possible. Row one, leaving a long tail. Check. Chain 21. Can do. Chaining 21. One, two, three. Got 21 chains here. And you can see, I think, a little bit my stitch definition, the V's there. You can kind of see where they fall. Now with your green fuzzy yarn, it will be more challenging to see those um, V's that you're used to going into for your first foundation row. Um, but take your time. Uh, if worse comes to worse, just start stabbing in there somewhere. If it grabs hold, just keep going. I think you get the feel for it the more you go along. If worse comes to worse, you can follow suit and grab a strand of thread. It doesn't have to be crochet thread, it can be sewing thread. Anything that's light and small and that would help give you that stitch definition as you're working with this new yarn. But you are going to add a, a little bit of a complication by adding a second strand of working yarn. There is a nuance to working with a second strand. So you just kind of have to decide how big of a challenge you want for your project here. Get your chains, count them, see if you can identify all your stitches, and then we're ready for our foundation row. Now, the instructions say to crochet in the back loops of each row to create a ridge. And while this will accomplish that, I am not going to do that. Crocheting through both loops with this particular yarn is challenge enough. If you were doing this version, I would recommend it because it does help accentuate the spiral. But for this particular project, I, I don't think it's necessary. If you want to go above and beyond or you're just looking for a challenge, go for it. It's not going to hurt the project. Um, and it will create a slightly different result that will be just as nice, but um, totally optional. Okay, so we're about to start the pattern. It's a very simple pattern, um, so it will be easy to remember. So most of the focus can be on the challenge of working with this yarn. The next row says to put two single crochets in the second chain from the hook. So I'm going to skip this first one, go into this second one twice. And this is an increase anytime you're adding stitches to make a project larger. So here we go in to my first stitch, yarn over, two loops on the hook, yarn over, pull through. And then I'm just going to repeat that process in this same hole here. So I go in, yarn over, come through, two loops on the hook, yarn over, through two. All right, now you can see I have two V's, two stitches there. We're just simply going to single crochet across our chain until we get to the last two chains of this row. So now you can work 
pretty mindlessly till you get to those last two stitches. All right, I'm here at my last two stitches of the chain and I'm ready to do a decrease. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna insert my hook into this first of the two stitches, yarn over, pull through, but that's where I'm going to do something different. And instead of finishing the stitch, I'm going to go directly into the hole next to it, yarn over, pull through. So I should have a total of three stitches on my hook and I should have entered those two chains below. And then I will yarn over and pull through all three. Now I have dragged an extra stitch with me, closed up underneath here to make my decrease, my single V at the top here. Now that will pinch your work so that it is slanting slightly this way. And that's what we want. We're gonna create kind of a slant. So on the tail side, this tail side, we will always be decreasing. And on the non-tail side, we will always be increasing. So you might wanna jot that down. That's a quick reminder of what row you're on if you forget. All right, moving on. For our next row, uh, we're gonna chain one at the end of each row, turn our work and go back the other way. So if I turn my work here, you can start to see those Vs in the top of my work which again, I can see a little bit more easily because I do have that white thread running through. Uh, but take your time, poke around in there, uh, get used to it, and I'm confident that you can get through it. Uh, if you have any questions, stop by the library. I am 100% happy to help you. I may have to sort through working with a patron. Uh, you might have to wait a moment, but uh, I would, I'm would. i totally happy to chat with you about any issues or questions you have. Or you can Facebook message us. Reach out any way you like, and I'll try to help you the best I can. So row two, remember, we just discussed we're on the tail side, so we're decreasing. So I'm gonna find my first V here and go in, yarn over, pull through one, and that's it for that stitch. I'm gonna carry over and go right in to stitch number two, yarn over and pull through. I've got two stitches engaged in the bottom here, and I've got three loops on my hook. So I'll yarn over and pull through to cinch those together. And you can see we are starting to slant over here. So that's a good sign. You actually want a slant in this project. How often does that happen that the slant is encouraged? All right, now pretty simple. We're just gonna single crochet all the way to the end of this row uh, until we get to the last stitch where we're gonna put the increase. So go to it. I'm at the end of my row, I've got one stitch left, and to check, you're always gonna want to have 20 stitches, because we changed 21, and then we skipped one when we started. So, let me count. I've got 18, which means after I put two here, because we're not on the tail side, I'll have 20. Row two complete. Now, as with this and every future row, we're gonna chain one before we turn. Before we get too carried away, this is where you're gonna to wanna to start keeping track of your rows. All right, this is what I like to do. I like to write out the number of rows that I will need in my pattern, and I cross them off as I complete them. So I've already done row one and two, 
So I've crossed those out and I'll continue crossing out each row after I finish. If you pick a mark on your project, like every time you make the turning chain or every time you do the last increase or decrease, just be consistent about when you make your mark and that'll help you keep track if you get called away in the middle of your project and you don't remember if you counted that row yet or not before you got up because these will be difficult to count afterwards. So this is what I like to do. Use whatever method works best for you. Here's where gauge comes into play. We'll get to a point in the project where when we pull our ends together, we'll want it to make a square. And in order to achieve that, you can add or subtract rows to this project as long as you end on an odd number. So if you need a few more, you can go up to 23 rows. If you need a few less, you can go down to 19. Whatever gets you to the square when we get to the folding portion, which you'll see later, um, is what you'll want to uh, reach for. Let's continue. We are on a non-tail corner. For our row number three, we're gonna chain one, turn, and we're gonna put two single crochets in this first stitch here. And then we will crochet all the way down, single crochet after our increase here, until we get to the last two stitches where we'll make a decrease. It looks like I've got two stitches left in my project, so I'm going to count, make sure I'm at, I uh, should be at 19 stitches, and we'll see how I did. And we're ready to decrease. So again, we go into that stitch, the first stitch of the decrease, yarn over, pull through, and then go directly into the second stitch of the decrease, yarn over, oops, yarn over, pull through, should have three stitches on your hook, three loops on your hook and two stitches engaged and draw through all three. We can see a nice slant on our decrease side and we can see a nice bowing out the other side on our increase side. This is what your project should look like at this point. Row three and I'm going to make my turning chain and check row three off on my post-it. All right and here's the fun part of the video. Continue in this manner increasing on one side and decreasing on the other until you have 21 rows. And I will see you after row 21.
I have to stop us right here. Um, I just got a congratulations on meeting your goal accomplishment on my Fitbit because it thinks I'm working out. <laughs> So here we have our shape, we have, it's kind of hard to show you, it's like a slanty parallelogram situation going on. So we've got something that looks like this, you're doing good. So we're at the point where you're going to need to check your gauge. I ended up doing 19 rows and then I took two out because it was a little too many um, because I do have the added bulk of working with two strands of yarn. You might need more rows than me, but this is what you wanna go for. We are going to take this corner, lay your project out. Here's my uh, ending working yarn. This is where I left off. I haven't fastened it off yet because I like to make sure everything's good before I cut my yarn. So I've got my uh, working yarn loop up here, the corner across the way here, and then my tail is over yonder. This is my working yarn and my other point. I'm gonna take this point and I'm gonna fold it down to that point. And I'm gonna take this point and fold it up to this point. And you should get a little square. Before, when I had the extra two rows, I had some extra bulk on either side. So I decided to take two rows out. If you don't have enough to reach, you might want to add rows. So here we have this seam in the middle. I am going to use this tail and I am going to whip stitch up this seam right here. So you can't see anymore. And then when I get to the end, because I've whip stitched all the way down here, I'm not going to cut my yarn because we're going to do something more with it. So since I'm happy and I'm going to start whip stitching, I will go ahead and cut this yarn and make sure you leave a nice long tail on this side too because we're going to sew up the other end. And the way I finish off my end is you'll only have the one loop here. Uh, re I open it up, reach for that yarn I just cut, and bring it through, and then I pull it shut. And that's all I do. Alright, so we're back to the square, and we're going to use this, this tail, the one that's attached to the front, not the one that's attached in the back here, this guy, to whip stitch all the way down, and then we'll be back here. <laughs> So our needle's threaded-ish. Do a double strand, Paige. It'll be fun, they said. I have my yarn set up like this. I got my little square. Got a little square. Got my yarn, and I'm gonna sew bloop, right up there. I'm gonna try to show you while I do it. Coming from here, so I'm just gonna pick the corner. And this is where you're going to want to be a little bit careful 
because I want to make sure that I'm going through a nice hole, like as if I were entering to crochet. I'd go under those two loops. I don't want to split and go through the yarns because that'll make it harder to pull those frilly edges through. So I'm going to try my hardest to go through stitches and, and not even just stitches. It doesn't have to be exact. I just want to make sure I'm going through pretty open spaces all the way down, picking one up from one side and one up from the other. I think I just went through that one. It doesn't matter. Then, like I said, we start it up here. Be careful, your tube will start to twist on you. Start it up here. And we slipped in, whipped in all stitch shut. I don't know if that's the technical term either. And I'm gonna leave this and I'm gonna use it because now we have a tube that you can see through. So I'm gonna keep that as lined up as I can. And uh, we are gonna weave in and out all around the edge here so that we can draw string, pull it shut. This is another place where you're gonna wanna be careful and try to go through the most open spaces that you can find so that you're not trying to drag your yarn through really uh, shredded bits of yarn. So I'm just gonna go in and out and in, out, all the way around until I get to the end. So I do a couple stitches at a time. My biggest thing is remembering where I started. I believe I'm at the beginning now. So I've zigzagged my yarn in and out all the way around so that when I pull this string, it should cinch itself closed. Now, if you were using a striped yarn, this is where you would see the spiral happen. Be careful tugging on your yarn that you don't tug so tightly that you break your yarn and all your hard work is for not. So you can't see my, if I wiggle, I can pull my finger back through there, but you want it nice and tight so that he doesn't wiggle open. And you might have to play with your yarn a little bit, push it and pull it until you can get it to slide through there. I just leave mine at this point. They say that you can tie it off and then do the other end, but I'm just going to do the other end and then make sure everything's tight and lined up before I finish it off. So. We have one more open end over here and one more long tail. So I will be weaving in and out on this side too, and then we'll be back here. All right, I'm at the point, you saw me struggle a bit there in the beginning, where I can cinch up this end too. There it goes. Hold it up tight. It's nice and tight there. So you find both ends here, and you're gonna make sure they're nice and tight, and then push them together. I like to make sure that they're in the middle and you can flatten them out into a disc. Now we're just going to pick an end and since my needle's already threaded over here, I've lined up the knots. All the while you might need to keep tugging on them because we haven't solidified anything yet. So keep them closed but keep them lined up and then, where is it? Okay. 
I'm just going to send this yarn through to the other side, I mean this needle through to the other side here. And then I can cut both of my working yarns about, I don't know, like I said, I leave too much yarn because I'm nervous. And don't forget your needle. Then the instructions say you can tie your yarn just like this. One knot, second knot, and then just so it doesn't come undone, I thread my needle again. I hate this part, the sewing part of anything. Sewing in the ends, ugh, it's just not my favorite. Anyway, so to make sure everything stays lined up, I'm gonna come back and forth through the meat of my um, sponge here so that they stay together. So I'm not going through the middle hole, I'm going through some of the stitches on the side. And since the yarn is so crazy, it doesn't even really matter where you do this because you can't see it, it all blends in. I'm gonna take the other tail and do the same thing. Over on this side, I'm gonna find a nice meaty part there. And come in and out. Sorry, I'm all over the place. There we go. Now I'm just going to send my yarn through the middle of the project, hook them out the other end over there, and snip them off. And then that strand of yarn is just going to get lost in there. Grab my last strand here. And then we're going to lose him. Find an easy access point. Yep. We're going to lose him in the middle of our sponge too. Pull that through. Snip it off, and then he just loses himself in there. And my friends, we have a scrubby. Oops, we have a scrubby. Next to this guy. He actually turned out just a little bit smaller, and I think that's because I had to sacrifice a couple rows because it was wider and therefore needed to be shorter to make a square. I don't know. But anyway, these are nice, dense, sturdy little scrubby pads, and it only took me a couple hours to make, so you could whip out several Christmas gifts uh, with these. You could use some holiday colors. That'd be fun. And uh, I hope you enjoyed today's video and that it felt a little bit like having crochet at the library. And I hope you stay tuned for more projects to come. If you made today's project, um, feel free to send us pictures. You can message them to us on Facebook, either through the crochet group that you may or may not be a part of. Um, feel free to join that or uh, just through our herbal library page, facebook.com slash herbal public library. We'd love to see what you're working on. Um, maybe you're working on something else too and you want to share that. The crochet group page on Facebook is a good place to do that. Um, and we can all just be supportive and uh, excited about each other's projects. And if you have any questions about this project, please come in and ask. I'm happy to troubleshoot with you. Uh, you might have to wait a few minutes for me uh, to become available if you don't call ahead. But I'm happy to uh, help you out and answer questions. Uh, you can call us. You can Facebook message us. You know, email, whatever works for you uh, if you have a question. All right, so stick around. We've got more of these to come. How do you guys feel about Tunisian crochet? Have you ever done that? Hang on. I guess that's the benefit of this setup. I can go look in my house for examples of projects. So these are Tunisian crochet hooks. They're just really long because you actually like knitting, leave your stitches on for a time. They build up on your hook and then you work them off. Um, you only use one though, not like knitting where you have two needles. 
So I have a whole bunch of different sizes of these. Um, they're just like regular crochet hooks, um, different sizes for different kinds of yarn. If you're interested in Tunisian crochet, it looks like this. This is the front. It's a like one-sided stitch. So the inside looks like this. The inside looks quite a bit knitted to me. This is a scarf that I crocheted in Tunisian crochet. I think it's also called the Afghan stitch. I think they used to make Afghans out of it, but I don't really know. Um, so I think this would be a fun project. Uh, it doesn't have to be a scarf. Uh, I'll teach you the basics of how to do this stitch and maybe you wanna make a larger, like a longer or a smaller swatch. Um, with this particular stitch, it'd be something that you'd like hook together um, because you can only make something as long as you can fit stitches on your hook. So um, there's also like an interlock crochet, which is really cool, which uses the basics from Tunisian crochet. Anyway, there's a lot of things we could do. Um, Tunisian crochet sounds fun and easy to do virtually. So if you'd like to learn that skill, stick around for next month when we will dive into Tunisian crochet. Also, all the time I've been saying it, I don't know if I'm saying it right. So whatever that is, that, that's, that's what we're gonna do. All right. Thanks so much for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye.